and welcome to another episode of Max Planck Florida's Neurotransmissions Podcast. In this episode, Jeremy and I sit down with a true leader in cell biology, Dr. Lippincott Schwartz. Throughout her career, Dr. Lippincott Schwartz has developed optical approaches that have transformed our understanding of organelles inside a cell from static, isolated compartments to a dynamic and interconnected network. These optical tools include the development of photoactivatable GFP and super resolution uh, microscopy, which have really driven her biological insights. Her incredible impacts have been recognized by numerous awards, including her election into the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. In today's episode, we both take a glimpse at her past work, but mostly focus on her future research directions and her vision to really combine the fields of cell biology and physiology so that we understand not only the role of the cell in isolation, but really how a cell functions in the context of complex tissues and an organism. Dr. Lippincott Shorts, we are so thrilled to have you sit down and talk with us about your science and your career. Thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. Thank you for inviting me. So you are the head of the 4D Cellular Physiology Research Direction at Genelia. Mm -hmm. um, can you start by maybe explaining to us what is 4D Cellular Physiology? Sure. Um, so this research program is aimed at trying to sort of marry two very different fields that have sort of um, diverged over the last 20 years, which is cell biology and physiology. And so, um, I mean, the way they've diverged is cell biology has become, or has traditionally been focused on uh, sort of reductionist-based systems that include tissue culture cells that are distant from a physiological system. And physiologists, um, because of the difficulty in really analyzing single cells, in a big physiological system has, has really developed other types of principles and concepts for how they describe the, the operation of a organism or organs. And so we're trying to bridge a cell biological understanding to these physiological systems. And one of the way to, ways to do that is to look at cell biology in the context of these tissues and whole organisms. And um, so that's what uh, we're trying to accomplish. The process is uh, challenging in the sense that we have to devise ways to actually look at cells in an organism. Uh, cells are very small, organisms are very big, tissues are big. But we also need to um, develop new principles for thinking about cells because cells that are doing physiological things in the context of a tissue or a whole organism are working as communities. They're a society, if you will. Mm -hmm. And they have special, they've uh, established specialized roles uh, in these systems, which um, the cell biologists who've been looking at cells as independent units have not really appreciated. But the tools that cell biologists can bring to bear, which is understanding the phenomenology going on inside cells, like how organelles are distributing, communicating with each other, is really fundamental if you're going to understand these cell communities and how they're being specialized. So it's a really exciting time. Um, I think um, at Genelia, we're not, I mean, we're hoping to sort of spur this type of research so that it will be more broadly done in other places around the world um, because we think that this is the, the future for uh, the field. Hmm. Yeah, and I've actually had the fortune of visiting Janelia and it's kind of a really unique and really exciting place. And I can see um, why it's well suited to sort of address a big challenge like this yes. type of research question. Yes. Maybe you could describe some of those attributes that... Oh, that great, yeah. Um, so first off, uh, um, the labs at Genelia are small. And uh, you know, typically, if you're a senior group leader like myself, you can have six people 
postdocs, graduate students, you know, uh, senior scientists work for you. And if you're a junior group leader, you have anywhere between two to four people who are working with you. Um, that may sm sound like a very restrictive feature of these labs, but in fact, it leads to some very exciting possibilities, especially because Janelia has um, a wide variety of what we call support teams, which are experts in particular areas, um, you know, molecular biology, computation, uh, you know, analysis of, you know, RNA-seq data, this uh, FIBSIM reconstruction, um, a variety of, of um, support teams that um, you can work with in a seamless way to do your science. And as a consequence, you can actually get a lot done. Mm. Um, you don't have to have experts in your lab being able to, to sort of be trained to do each one of these very sophisticated um, uh, uh, technological things. But the other feature of these small labs is that it encourages collaboration because at Genelia, we don't have outside, you know, we don't have outside funding, we don't have teaching obligations. So you're constantly interacting with other people. And as a consequence, there is very creative collaboration going on. Um, you know what other people are doing. Other, if you really, you know, you're running the, the, the building itself is designed so that you run into people, free coffee, you know, uh, subsidized food, lunch, breakfast, and dinner. And so it just leads to people bumping into each other and sharing their research. And then very quickly, you come up with ideas for things that you can do together. It also helps that we're in an isolated um, part of Northern Virginia. It's, it's beginning to boom, but, uh, you know, when you get on campus, you are, you stay on campus for most of the day. <laughs> and it's a beautiful campus. It certainly is, yeah. I mean, so you had mentioned that you're trying to merge back physiology with cell biology. Yeah. What are the kinds of skill sets that folks are uh, bringing to this sort of collaborative uh, integration of the two things within the 40 um, cellular biology, uh, physiology group? So the first thing is um, model systems. And, uh, you know, one area, one sort of global sort of model system areas is brain-body communication, um, trying to understand how neurons are innervating particular tissues, what is, what are the interaction pathways, what, uh, you know, to what extent are synapses or just free peptides um, leading to this communication, what do these synapses look like in these tissues um, and how does that feed back to the to the brain to allow brain body communication so that's one area that is sort of emerging mm -hmm. another area relates to really just fundamental mechanistic cell biologic biology of tissues whether it be tissues during development tissues as a organism is aging um, or uh, tissues that are repairing, um, really just f trying to dissect these um, aspects uh, at a sort of deep cell biological level. And um, the technologies that are being employed uh, include, you know, whole organismal imaging, uh, either live or using very advanced electron microscopy. Um, in particular, we're using this focused ion beam scanning electron microscopy uh, that can section, at, can section through a whole tissue or organism and allow for 3D reconstruction. Um, and because you can, you can shave, you can mill an image repeatedly through the whole cell or tissue, you can, and you can do this at such, at very fine milling um, thickness, you can get isotropic views, X, Y, Z equivalent, um, 
any part of this tissue to build beautiful 3D, 3D reconstructions of the way organelles are distributed, um, to look at, you know, Christi, to look at, you know, how close, you know, lysosomes are with other organelles, lipid droplets, um, how plasma membranes, primary cilia are communicating with e among different cells. All of this kind of information is now available and um, ready for trying to make sense of. Uh, but I should say making sense is a whole new challenge that uh, is requiring us more and more to rely on computational approaches, um, theoretical approaches, uh, AI to get through this data set uh, in a way that can bring out meaning. So it's the challenge is you can't just look at this data and suddenly something pops out very easily. Um, sometimes that happens, a lot of times it doesn't, and you have to then rely on AI and other types of computational systems to help you quickly analyze this data. So maybe we could actually just, you know, for people who might not be as familiar yeah. looking at this data, sort of give them a feeling of sort of the scale of this data. So you talk about having this fine resolution. Yeah. What sort of resolution are we um, able to do? And what sort of volumes are we actually able to capture? And sort of maybe an idea of how much data, as you have sort of yeah. hinted at, is actually in that. Well, I can get to petabyte uh, data sets. Um, there are different scales. If you're doing time-lapse imaging, let's say with a lattice light sheet mic microscope, you're looking at a you know, 300, uh, uh, 200 nanometer, 300 nanometer resolution scale, um, but you can do huge volumes and you can do it very fast. So you're acquiring 40 information. In the case of these uh, EM, scanning EM data sets, the FibSim data sets, it's a single time point, but you are at four nanometer voxels. Um, and again, you can do a whole tissue. Um, a whole cell takes, if you're going to do four nanometer voxels, a whole cell will take you two weeks to mill an image continuously. The data sets are understandably enormous, but more challenging than that is trying to segment these data sets because you have, um, you got to, in any particular scanning EM image, you have a bunch of electron densities that correlate with a membrane or, you know, a, a phase condensate, a lipid droplet. Um, and you have to, it's very hard, you can't just immediately look at it and say, oh, this is the endoplasmic reticulum, this is the mitochondria, because you've just gone through a very thin slice through it. So you have to um, look at many slices on top of each other and reconstruct at each level. And the com using computer algorithms, you can do this pretty quickly. Um, and then you train those computers to uh, based on what you know from the structure from other studies, you train it to say, oh yeah, this is round, uh, it's got this kind of density, this is a lysosome. Uh, this structure is elongated, it's got a whole bunch of fenestra in it, that's a mitochondria. So you train your the computer um, algorithms to be able to uh, identify um, these, so it, they can segment and then they um, they basically categorize the structures for you. And then you start asking, okay, how big, are, you know, what's the percentage of these structures? How, you know, what's the chance of them being localized here or there? And then you start formulating meaning to this data in terms of what these organelles are doing, why they're situated there, et cetera. So it's incredible, the type of data that we're able to collect now. And yeah. throughout your career, you've really sort of been at the forefront of 
imaging technology, particularly when it comes to cell biology and looking at organelle. And you kind of transformed, I'd say, our image of, you know, this textbook picture of a cell with these, you know, static, isolated individual organelles into what we now know is a much more fluid, dynamic, interconnected, I'd say, network mm -hmm. um, of organelles. And I'm just wondering, thinking back um, to sort of your early experiments when you were, you know, labeling, um, you know, a lysosomal protein with yeah. an antibody, which was totally yeah. state of the art at the time to see, you know, where that protein was localized in the cell to now and the types of data we can collect. Could you or did you ever sort of imagine that we would be able to sort of reconstruct, you know, these whole 40 cellular contexts? Yeah. No. <laughs> I mean, you, it's so, it's very interesting in science that it's very hard to see too much in the future. Um, maybe part of it was I was pretty naive when I was doing those early experiments. I was a graduate student or postdoc. Um, I was just focused on, I've got some antibodies that, I've tagged with some fluorescent proteins. And in, in the case of lysosomes, uh, we had made a monoclonal antibody prep that, and the monoclonal antibodies we know recognize a single protein. And so you can purify these different monoclonal antibodies. And when you labeled them on the cell, you saw different things in the cell light up. And and this is when we were first describing cellular organization. And, uh, you know, when we, when we used one particular monoclonal antibody that recognized a lysosomal membrane protein, LAMP, all these structures that we now know are lysosomes lit up. And, the, you know, the challenge was, okay, what are these structures? <laughs> what are they doing? You know, just the sort of minimal trying to try minimal analysis and it was only once you got through that and then you started looking at other organelles you know peroxisomes er that you start s thinking about the relationships between these structures i mean what's very interesting um is that you know, after we started identifying all the structures within the cell, um, very quickly it was clear these structures could communicate with each other through me vesicles, membrane trafficking pathways. And so for a huge period of time, um, 20 years, there was huge focus on characterizing the process by which these membrane transport intermediates form, target, um, dissolute, absorb, you know, fuse, et cetera. That was the direction that people in this field were all embracing. Nobody was thinking about how these organ, the fact that these organelles could associate with each other intimately through tethering molecules and exchange lipids, calcium, other metabolites directly. Um, that only came uh, once new tools became available, atomic structures, calcium sensors, um, high resolution images that where you could actually see these organelles abutted right next to each other. But that has ushered in a whole new field, which is called contact site biology, um, where people are trying to understand crosstalk between these organelles that does not involve vesicular traffic, but involves direct relay of small molecules, metabolites, across the two bilayers of different organelles that are abutted to each other. So you start realizing, you know, you're, when you're doing science, you're in a, a world, a very circumscribed world. Um, to the extent to which you have vision outside that world, you are, you're lucky, you know, you can, you, you can follow it through. But frequently, 
the only way you can get out of that world is with new technology that totally opens up things, that is convincingly showing a way out of your little world of thinking in that topic. Um, so I've been really interested in new technologies as a consequence of that because I've seen how they transform the way we think about science. So uh, you, you talked about how there's this, this new uh, context bio biology. Yeah, yeah. What, why, what it, why, why do these organelles interface so closely? Why, why, do, why aren't they dependent on this vesicular, um, vesicular messaging scheme? What is it about the actual contact between the organelles? Is there a specific example you might be able to give us of two organelles that work closely together? And uh, yeah. why, why they would form contacts within a cell? So they form contacts, contacts because proteins on each of the partner organelles can interact with each other. And that sort of anchors the two organelles. And once the two organelles are sort of anchored at some level, other things can start localizing there, like ion channels or um, lipid transfer molecules that uh, can start operating at those sites. And evolutionarily, if that gives an advantage to the cell, it's going to be selected for. Mm -hmm. And so that's the idea of how these things came into existence. The vesicular trafficking pathways are mainly carrying proteins to different places in the cell. You don't get proteins that are moving through these contact sites. It's mainly lipids that are flipping or calcium or other types of metabolites that are being pumped across the membrane bilayers. Mm -hmm. um, the membrane vesicular trafficking pathways are ways um, for differentiating a organelle like, for instance, the way the endoplasmic reticulum can, can, can transform itself into a Golgi apparatus uh, and, and how a Golgi apparatus can transform itself to create a membrane transport intermediate that ultimately is going to give lipid to the plasma membrane for expansion and insertion of membranes that are involved in cell-cell recognition, et cetera. Um, the... Membrane trafficking pathways are also really important for interaction with the outside world. I think that's how it evolved. Mm -hmm. um, these newly formed eukaryotic cells that have these complex intracellular um, organizations had what makes them so special is that they can, um, the innovation of this membrane trafficking system, which is characteristic of eukaryotic cells, was to allow these cells to be able to create an environment outside of themselves. They can secrete things. Uh, they can also put membrane proteins on their surface that can stick to the stuff that they secrete, allowing them to crawl and um, sort of rearrange their shapes. And at the same time, these membrane trafficking pathways allow these eukaryotic cells to take up stuff from their environment that they can eat and break down and use for building themselves. So um, anyway, yeah, membrane trafficking and compartmentalization in eukaryotic cells is, is really fascinating at many, many levels, not just the biology per se, but the evolution and um, you know what is fundamentally doing for the cell. And, and to some degree, it sounds like that maybe is also what gets you from single cell to now tissue where, where these interactions are. Exactly. Crucial. Exactly. Yeah. That's why eukaryotes are multicellular frequently. Yeah. I love sort of um, thinking about the evolutionary nature of this. It just, um, it's something that I think, yeah. you know, when we get sort of really caught up in our experiments, we can sometimes forget, but I think it's really important to always, you know, that's such an important force in biology and it's important to sort of step back and, and remember that that's, you know, when we start asking the questions why, that's sort of where it comes from. Exactly. Yeah, I always tell people in my lab that um, you have to keep evolution 
in your mind because that's the logic that um, that's the log the logical framework to understand the way cells are functioning because cells are all interlinked. I mean, you don't cells only came into existence through an evolutionary history. So everything what we see now is only possible because it's been optimized in a lot of different ways. Um, so we're trying to chip away at what is that optimization. Um, and to the extent to which you can understand the machinery for that optimization from the framework of evolution, you can link it to a lot of other things. Um, so moving forward, what do you sort of see as you know, the next major questions either that you're particularly enthusiastic about or you think the field sort of needs to tackle? So for me, I'm very interested now in metabolism. I mean, I was, there was a period where I was excited about mechanics and stuff and how that's operating at the level of tissues, um, which it is, but I think underlying the tissue mechanical sensing is is metabolism basically um cells are all about energy um they they can't work without getting a food source breaking down that food source or basically um creating an energy source depending on what kind of cell you are but basically cells are all about um converting energy from the environment to a product at some, and the product is often used as an energy source by other cells. So all of the cells are intercommunicating with each other um, in a in a huge system. Um, I'm very interested in the idea of life as a biosphere, as a bio system, not just life being single cells. All of these single cells are dependent on each other in a in a bigger picture for life on Earth to subsist. So when I think about tissues and whole organisms, I'm very interested in seeing whether there's a way that we can think of it from the perspective of metabolic pathways and the way that they're being optimized. Um, and it's challenging because we don't, it's very hard to understand metabolism other than if you're doing, you know, pulse chase labeling or, you know, sort of tracer labeling. That's the conventional way. But that's really hard if you're trying to piece apart the way that a tissue is, is organized because you don't have the spatial um, or temporal resolution to, to watch metabolism unfold. So we need new tools to be able to look at this. We need... Um, for me, I would love visualization tools because I'm very much, um, I like uh, seeing structure and function operating together and, um, you know, being able to see where ATP is being generated, glucose is being manipulated, fatty acids are being consumed, really would be amazing to be able to see in a tissue. Yeah, so in the same way that you've sort of untangled how, you know, individual proteins might move through organelles. You, we want to need, need to be able to see the same thing for metabolites, lipids, and other molecules. Yeah, and what's interesting about metabolism is, um, although we can see it operating in a, at the single cell level, in a tissue, I think there is specialization going on. And that's, what's, that's the secret of the way these tissues are really operating. Um, some, some cells are near a nutrient source, near a blood supply. Other cells are not. And that's going to dictate different types of metabolism that's going on in these cells. It's going to dictate different types of outputs, um, secretory products that these cells are making. Because, you know, if you have a lot of energy input, the flow over of that energy input is frequently carbon you know, carbon-based macromolecules that are going to be secreted, fats and sugars. Um, and those fats and sugars are carried on proteins, um, carried on large lipid molecules that are secreted. 
Um, and so the unfolding of a tissue is, in a way, the unfolding of this metabolic system uh, that's operating. And I think we need to figure that out. Well, I wish we had another hour to talk. I can't believe how quickly the time's gone, but we have to get you to your keynote lecture for our neuroimaging course. Um, it was wonderful to sit down and talk with you. Thank you so much. Thank you. As always, thank you for listening to Max Planck Florida's Neurotransmissions Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode and would like to help support the podcast, please subscribe and tell your friends. 